My topic this evening is uh, grafted, grafted vegetables and why do we graft vegetables? I think uh, the, the practice of vegetable grafting originated from Japan and Korea where land is limited. Crops are grown often uh, continually year after year, whereas uh, in the U.S. we rotate crops. We don't have a problem with the, the soil diseases uh, for plants grown every year. So uh, vegetable seedling grafting practices will overcome soil-borne diseases. You see root stocks that are very highly tolerant to root diseases, often those rootstock cultivars, rootstock plants are from uh, wild native plants and so on. And so uh, there will be, uh, there will be no uh, crop rotation needed and still can produce quality and ye high yield crops year after year. Now, uh, next one will be, the some common popular popular crops that are grafted include uh, cucurbit, uh, solanaceous crops, and cucurbit crops, watermelon, muskmelon, usually in case of both Asian countries, so oriental melons, cucumbers, or summer squash, and solanaceous crops like a tomato, potato, uh, eggplant, and peppers. And of course, a potato, you don't use as a potato, produces tubers underground. So it's usually potato grafting is used as a rootstock. Some cases you can grab the sweet potato on morning glory to produce early flowering. Those plant breeders are using that techniques. Um, this is an old slide. I, I often show that the uh, show this slide at uh, 1996 in Japan, uh, field production versus, oh, I see that somehow it scatters, I uh, don't know what happened, you know. And I just, about 92 of over 90%, it's a strange, it scatters, okay. Um, watermelon cucumbers, uh, in Korea, similar, but 90, 98% of, of watermelons were grafted for greenhouse production, whereas field, field grown ones are less that time. But now we'll see more about uh, peppers, for example, uh, about field grown ones, about 35%, greenhouse grown, about 95% peppers uh, grafted. Now, We'll talk about some grafting. We usually we are used to, to graft woody plants, including uh, fruit trees. This is, picture shows the uh, dwarf rootstock used in grafting apples. Apples are almost grown just like very densely with a very low height. So you get the management is easier. And uh, within four years, you can produce a apple crops like this. So I got this one from Korea. And also grafting is used very, very effectively to combine different growth habits. Say, say for example, here, a uh, picture on the right side of the mulberry, the weeping form of a cyan cultivus grafted on straight upward growing rustock of a mulberry. So it is very nice. You can generate nice form or uh, sh uh, shade plants in the very hot uh, climate, like in Arizona and so on. That's a good uh, way of uh, changing kind of a, as a grafted plants and two different growth habits into one. If you are interested in changing uh, cultivars or varieties of apples and pear on an existing tree in your backyard, you can graft 
uh, new varieties, cyan woods and new varieties on branches, like cutting off the uh, main branches. And by using graft, in this case be not your bark graft. And, and you can harvest the fruits of uh, several different varieties, even from, from one tree. That would be, it's called in a horticultural term, top working of apple trees. Next, this would be top work plum tree is grown on a university campus at uh, Syracuse, New York. And it's the coverage uh, was by CBS News. This tree has about 40 different varieties of cultivars showing different colors as well as uh, uh, fruits of a uh, uh, different cultivars. It's kind of a uh, one time several years ago, it was a good uh, uh, story covered by major news companies. Okay. Um, now in woody plant, we would like to combine cambium layers of uh, the cyan wood and rustock for successful grafting. So this will be on the left, the picture on the left, we show how to make a, a whip and tongue graft, kind of made as a tongue and cyan wood and rustock, they're locked in. And it's very good success for uh, grafting. And you will see from your right side right here, it's a splice grafting, red and whip and tongue, making sure at least the cambium layer of a cyan wood is in contact, very uh, good contact with the rustock stem. And it doesn't matter whether it's both sides have to be contacted. I think as long as a good contact on one side of the stem is a good, then they will heal very nicely and form nice, graft, healthy grafted plants. Herbaceous plants is different. You don't have to worry about aligning cambium layers. Cambium layers is just very characteristic of a woody plant stem. It'll be cambium layers actively dividing cell cells. It's cambium surround the xylem tissue, the woody portion in the center. And that cambium is responsible for outward growth. The stem growth will increase as time passes. Whereas in herbaceous plants, you don't have to worry about it. As long as you can get the uh, uh, seedling stems connected and they fuse together by callusing first and then forming vascular tissues together and then the grafted plant. And there are different ways of combining the cyan cultivar and the root star cultivars by inserting different ways uh, uh, shoots on top of a rustock stem and in bottom case of you can use a pins to combine these and as long as uh, they stay together in uh, physically and they will heal very nicely the most common method is using grafting clips this picture is shown several different times and it appears that the Asian countries use more grafting clips than we in the US. We have uh, uh, use of tubes, grafting tubes inserted. And for this, you have to have a, the diameter of a cyan stem and diameter of a rustock stem has to be same to use this uh, tubes. But it's, Somehow the uh, U.S. Uh, there are more uh, practices with the grafting tubes as compared to the clips. It'll be on the right side. There's a lot of uh, the grafting clips used. They are retrieved and then used for several many many years. This will be seen. It's a grafting scene. It's early spring, and it's very busy time and people get within the greenhouse and grab the seedlings and plant it for the uh, field 
you know, as this occurs uh, before the normal growing season. And uh, this, this uh, cut grab used, you know, now they found that especially for cucurbit crops, you can use a cut grab, cut grab, and that means the seedling stems, usually hypocardial seedling stems are cut off and grafted and used in grafting. So it'll be lower portion right here, it'll be uh, rooster stem or hypocardial. And then the cyan cultivar on top is a clip together and then planted. And then while the bottom of the stem can generate adventitious root. This is the new shoot formation from places uh, originally not really intended to produce roots. And so adventitious root formation takes place at the same time that callus formation and kind of a joining of a tissue, the grafted union is taking place. And this will be a cut graft, be cyan rootstock, and it is a stuck rootstock, stem is a stuck to cell pack, and then they are now it's a callus and kind of incubated in places like that with a high humidity and lower light intensity. And when I visited this greenhouse in Korea, they were producing about 2.5 million grafted plants a year, and it was a large operation, very good success. And I think it's more. Uh, a U.S. Uh, greenhouse and more, the special seed companies are providing grafted plants, although they are expensive, you know. So there should be seedling grafted tomatoes ready to be marketed, shipped, and uh, the uh, clips before shipping can be retrieved and saved for use for next year. Now, we use seedling grafting rootstock. You know, those some rootstocks, plants, if we seed germinated, we grew them and they don't produce really good fruit. They just grow very vigorously. And that's very good, healthy. There's no root diseases and so on. They may produce the flowers and so on. Some, a oh, few fruits, but not really uh, much. As compared to regular, Tomatoes in the background here, you see huge size. You know. And you'll see, we did a lot of experiments on different rootstocks to see whether there's an interaction between rootstock cultivar and uh, cyan cultivars. And here's the middle two is a Estamino and Maxi Ford. That is a, usually most, many seed companies carry this, but uh, they initially, Johnny's selected seed and carry this, and we usually buy this. And have a, I brought some rootstock seeds from Korea's blocking solution special. Yeah, it's a little bit producing a little bit bigger fruit, but not uh, quality that is edible. And rootstock cultivar seeds are very expensive. Like a one seed is about fifty cents. Even grafted plants, and as you know, I took this took this picture from Johnny's selected seeds, and, and uh, this one is a uh, uh, brandy wine tomato grafted on Maxi Ford, and this is a uh, same cultivar grafted on Estamino, uh, Estamino, and they're both are good, expensive. I hear that I saw. The prices about thirty five, three hundred to four hundred dollars per one tray of a grafted plant. It's a seventy two grafted plant. It comes to about three point five to five dollars per plant. Average about four dollars. It's a kind of expensive. Um, you use uh, also grafting for 
peppers. Uh, I get this is these uh, slides from Korea, and Koreans use a lot of uh, hot peppers for making kimchi and so. And uh, most greenhouse peppers are grown what over ninety three percent grafted peppers in the greenhouse. Field grown ones, again about but over thirty five percent uh, grafted. So they are the grafting, they're using automated grafting machine. This will be pepper uh, seedling graft machine. And when I was uh, uh, moderating a session on grafting, the International Horticulture Society Congress, and I think it's a 2007, the people, a lot of people had an interest in buying these machines. And uh, again, there's be about per hour, about 400 gra seedling grafts in, in this one machine. And some visitors from Europe and then people who have a farm in Mexico, they have to buy many, many units because they need to plant millions of plants a day. And you have to have uh, several hundred units of the grafting machine to satisfy their needs and so on. So they still have to improve the speed of uh, grafting uh, by machine. Use cut seedling graft is a kind of a now it's getting popular for vine crops like a grafting watermelons and melons, greenhouse and a field crop. And in a, this picture there, lower left, the middle one is ungrafted and has the regular grafting. And then this was a actually cut graft. The hypocotyl was a cut and adventitious root was generated. And there's, there's much, much healthier. So it's a, they are practicing. Somehow the graft union, there's so much exudation of the water that hinders healing of uh, the union. And sometimes they found that getting rid of a rut as a source of a water can really help fast healing and growth of a grafted plant. And this would be a, a rootstock used, used for cu uh, uh, watermelons and so on. This is usually wild uh, species, the uh, germ plants coming from wild plants. These, I, I brought them seeds from Korea and uh, planted the seeds because we ran out of seeds and grew them on the campus. And also the watermelon, almost, they look like a watermelon. It's not, it's not sweet at all. You cannot really cut them, they're so hard. The rind is hard. You have to use a big you know, knife to really kind of, uh, with the force you have to cut. And so it's really like it's not edible. I have a lot of seeds we use for seedling grafting for cucurbit plants like a watermelon and melons. Those are the seedlings. And if anybody interested in uh, getting seeds, please contact me. I can send the, those uh, seeds. Now, seedling graft, grafted melons in the field, not only in Japan and Korea, this will be, I think this one came from Israel, I think. And grafted melons, and here, the, because of the uh, resistance of a rootstock, and it's very nice, whereas un, as compared to ungrafted row of same cyan cultivar. There's a non-grafted row right here, too. So it's uh, popularity is uh, growing, and uh, uh, it was a prize for grafting and then production is uh, uh, afford the um, justifiable, but grafting, the use of gra grafting, grafted vegetables and field production is very uh, well accepted practice. And at NDSU, we did this research on grafted tomatoes, and this will be grafted tomatoes using all different types of combinations, cyan and rootstock, cultivar combinations. This would be rooting and the callusing. 
success rate is 100 percent this is in growth channel and actually we practice herbaceous or seedling grafting uh, very much actually our NDSU is uh, one of the earlier probably the most earliest institution that uh, taught uh, seedling grafting than anybody else in the uh, in other universities in in the United United States. You know, I happened to moderate a seedling grafting workshop for the uh, American Society for Horticultural Science in early 2000, and uh, a lot of people had interest. And nobody really heard about the seedling grafting. Now it's uh, this technology is being well adapted uh, given in the United States. These are the uh, grafted plants evaluated in the field where the graduate student is Zigong Wu. Now, uh, then it'll be you know, one of the field days. I think it's a Dr. Tom Cobb is uh, watching it. That's I think uh, right here. <laughs> uh, so it was several years ago. And uh, we did grafting usually uh, use of an indeterminate type of a tomato variety. It'll be better. So this will be big beet grafted on a uh, special maybe rock cultivar from Korea. And it's very, very good in the, in the field. Um, this is a uh, Zigong who tested all these graft combinations between cyan cultivar and rustocks and on, um, he before he finished his phd program at ndsu he joined the army i think i think he's uh, uh, still serving uh there and hopefully after uh getting out of a uh, service hope he can come back and finish his uh, uh degree yeah. we had a uh, uh, student uh, this be uh, Suman Parajuli, who's from Nepal. Last year, he finished uh, his thesis on tomato graft evaluation of a grafted plants as compared to non-grafted plants. So it will be published sometime in the spring in Hot Science. And he, he, he's gone to uh, different universities, Guelph uh, University in Canada. Now, you can use combinations, interspecific graft combination. For example, here's a eggplants grafted on potatoes, kind of a working very well, they, very well. And uh, so we we thought maybe a good idea to have a, some grafting of a tomatoes, eggplants on potato rootstock. Again, potato rootstocks are not grown from grown from seed; they are grown from spud spuds. And uh, seed potatoes sprout well, but non-seed sprout uh, uh, potato non-seed potatoes they, just, they don't sprout well in a, in when you buy from uh, stores. And then we can get the the eyes or whatever the uh, uh, spud in chopped into pieces and planted into cell packs and they grow and then uh, cyan material from tomato or eggplants, eggplant, eggplant and tomatoes is grafted. And we did the, those potato and tomato potato graft. I don't know if it's the commercial value or not, but it was pure the interest in it. Mommy was an undergraduate student who grew them in it. She's digging at the end of the uh, growing season. And you will see there's a dug out that the top tomato cultivar, you know, cult, cult, tomato top producing, and then potato tubers underground. And we had a, some different combinations, as being as the big beet grafted on Yukon gold potato, will be grafted plants on the right side as the non-grafted and of a uh, non-grafted potato. 
you can see the top, the foliage is kind of a, it dried out uh, at the end of the uh, growing season, but it still be still green and grafted plants. So actually tomato provide a nourishment and then stayed, uh, stayed uh, longer with the still growing, whereas a potato is already uh, dried out and ready to be dug. And so you can see right here, let's see, um, and as compared to uh, potatoes grown a non-grafted potato, potato tubers from non-grafted plant, as grafted plants, usually smaller number of uh, uh, tubers on grafted plants. You can see the, you can, you can kind of, uh, you explain that all the photosynthesis going into fruits and tubers, they have to be allocated and they're kind of a competition. So I can imagine it'll be grafted plants producing less number or total yield, the weight as compared to non-grafted potatoes. There'll be celebrity grafted on Yukon gold, again, it's a big celebrity, it's an, it's kind of a semi determinate type. You know? So we have another one, it'll be the big beef grafted and red viking, similar result. So with this, um, it's, a, it's a same thing as a celebrity and red viking. Um, and uh, whether you should have some grafted tomato or tomato, because we haven't tried the cherry type, small fruited tomato cultivars grafted on potato. So we like to try to continuously later on. The idea is to get maximum yield from, I mean, from top portion and bottom portion, both fruits and uh, tubers. So with that, I think Kala earlier presented a container gardening and I like to send some grafted plants to her and maybe she can grow in containers and can enjoy uh, harvesting tomatoes throughout the growing season and in the patio area and toward the end of the uh, growing season and harvest potato tubers. And uh, we it, it tested some potato varieties that give a strong stem so that we don't have to stake the tomatoes. That's uh, one thing we have to work on. And that the longevity of a potato vine just be not as long as a tomato, especially the uh, indeterminate type tomato. So we are selecting the varieties that will one thing, a potato cultivar that can be used as a rustock without staking and so on. That's uh, uh, the ongoing uh, work we are doing. This is the last slide. I think we have, uh, we will have available seedling grafted plant, tomato, tomato grafting and tomato, potato grafting, eggplants grafted in potato and watermelon and cucurbit, the resistant uh, rustocks. If uh, anyone interested in, you may uh, contact me. I have a contact info information, my cell phone and email uh, address. And please, uh, uh, through Tom, and uh, let me know. I don't know how many we will have. The students are no longer coming to campus. So there will, there will be some uh, plants available. Uh, hopefully, by the time they're ready to be transplanted, all this uh, virus uh, scare is over. So uh, with that, I think I would like to entertain questions. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Yes, we do have a, a few minutes here for questions. <clears throat> One of them has to do with your pomato plant there that you grow. Mm -hmm. does, does it have any special cultural practices or nutrient needs that that plant has compared to a standard tomato or a standard potato? 
I don't think it is very, they're, they're picky, just regular, just the condition, well, fertilizers or soil condition. But we do find, did find that clay soils, I mean, the Fargo clay soil, they don't produce much uh, potato tubers on grafted plants. So. Yeah, I, what do you think? Do you think if you had a uh, limited sp space, does it make sense to have uh, pomatoes? Wouldn't you, shouldn't you just grow a tomato plant and a potato plant and let it go at that? Or is just for fun that we're growing pomatoes, huh? I, I don't know. It's a commercial. If you have potato growers, you go into all this possible trouble and produce tomato plants or not. But just it's like an oddity. You know, you maybe uh, for fun, you may grow. Right. If you have a home uh, patio, you need to grow something like that. This right. is we can clear it around. Yep. How about when you grow, uh, let's say, a grafted tomato? Does uh, do you find any advantages as far as uh, resistance to disorders like blossom end rot or uh, foliar um, blights? We haven't checked. The, you can see the regular potato. They became senescent, and they became old uh, sooner than grafted plant. There's some uh, distribution or translocation of photosynthase uh, from top to bottom may influence, but I don't know it'll be any, there's any value, economic, the uh, commercial value of that. So this is just for, for probably for hobbyists. Or like if you were a, a high tunnel grower and you were planting tomatoes in the same soil for years, mm -hmm. uh, the grafted tomato could help because the rootstock would resist any soil diseases, right? Correct. Yeah, correct. So we got a really adventurous gardener here. They want to graft two different types of tomatoes on a potato plant. Wow. Of course, you think you that, that, that. that's Syracuse no, that plum. That's a right idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could just keep going. <laughs> yeah, good. I may do that then. Okay, <laughs> please communicate with me. Okay. <laughs> okay. And how about when you have a? Okay, people love your tomatoes. How <laughs> does the taste of the tomatoes change because of the potato rootstock? There's no kind of changes. The uh, the performance of a cyan wood, cyan, cyan cultivars, it all depending on the cultivar, uh, specific to cultivar. And I don't think uh, there will be influence, uh, taste or anything from rootstock to top portion. Earlier, when they did, they did graft an, uh, watermelon on wild gourd, they thought the maybe watermelon is not tasting as sweet as you know there may be some taste of wild goat but then now i think uh, that worry is dispelled so uh i don't think there's a contribution in terms of uh, fruit character the quality characteristics or taste or nutritional characteristics with grafted plant and you know, uh, grafted cyan from uh rusta Okay. They're just a living and a supporting. Okay. Yeah. Good. But the grafted rootstock, let's say on a grafted tomato, it can encourage higher yields. Can it yes. not? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So higher yields and a more stable production, greater disease yes. resistance. Yes. That's and, why uh, almost 100% of the tomatoes, field grown, greenhouse grown in Korea, Japan, grafted. Okay. Yep. Okay, that's really, there's a lot of comments here, Dr. Lee, about, uh, well, one quick question. How long does it take the callusing process or, you know, the it's healing just like process? Within 10 days, it's a very good, efficient, and the success rate is, again, 100%. Yeah, with good humidity, that's the key yeah. there. Um, you have to cover up in case of home practice. I didn't go over the greenhouse growth, how they maintain during callusing period. Uh, the cover-up with the plastic tents and so on. I should have shown that, but that's possible. If there's anybody is interested in doing this, and please uh, uh, let me know. I will just uh, try to help you out. Uh, 
and grafted. Uh, oh my goodness, this person's worried. Uh, the, the, the grafting will not control Colorado potato beetles. <laughs> no, okay. they will not do that. Sorry. Colorado you know, potato lot... beetle be specific in potato, right? And then top portion is a tomato. Right. I don't think that you graft it. But you can graft Colorado. Let me see. Colorado potato beetle resistant cyan wild species of a Solanum grafted in regular species, then avoid the uh, problem by infestation. Then maybe, maybe, maybe work out. You know, because yeah, but yeah. then if it's a wild potato, you're not going to have any good yield. Though. Well, but because that I think rustock is a producing. You're right. Uh, them that produce tubers, so, so it may not be influenced by. <laughs> Uh, ah. <laughs> okay, this sounds like there's a whole world of possibilities as far <laughs> as how fascinating it is when you kind of play with nature a little bit. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of comments here that reflect how fascinated they are in this topic. And everybody can can contact Dr. Lee later for uh, specific questions or maybe to get access for a few of these grafted plants from Fargo. But for now, we want to thank you tonight, Dr. Lee, that really interesting talk.